in my big dream imagining, we get to distill the deepest stories and the truths that come out of community and out of history. When we have our voices heard and have our messages heard, we become leaders. Ietsup Uweliel, CISCM, Antha Jada Gabrielle Pape. Welcome to the Drawing Wisdom video podcast. So we're in season two of our podcast and season one was recorded at the height of the pandemic. And season two has been recorded as the pandemic has taken a little bit of a quieting down. We've been able to, in the last couple of episodes, record in person together in real time. So you'll see us without masks and we've taken all the precautions and for social distancing while we're doing this, but, um, just so you know, this is the times we're in. And as a team, we're looking after each other, looking after our communities and taking very good care to be uh, as responsible as we can be. In this next conversation, we're going to be visiting with my dear friend, Danette Jubinville, who is a birth worker, who is a doula. It's a wonderful person to sit with and learn about the good teachings that she carries and how she shares them with um, birthing women and families. So enjoy. I guess before we dive in, do you want to just introduce yourself as you'd like to be known in this circle, in this podcast? Yeah. My name is Danette Chubinville. My Anishinaabe name is Biwasha Kwe, Blowing Snow Woman. I am Cree and Soto from the Pasqua First Nation in Treaty 4. I am Lynx clan, and I am also a French, German, Jewish, Scottish, and English ancestry. Um, I was born in Musqueam Territory at Richmond General Hospital and um, raised in different parts of the Lower Mainland, and I currently live in Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Territory in East Vancouver. And what are the other parts of your identity that are also, that you carry? Yeah, so usually I talk about myself as a mother, so I have a six-year-old daughter, her name is Keiston, and she's Kwakwakiwaka Nuhalk on her father's side as well. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University. And I'm a founding member of the Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective, uh, which we started back in 2015. Um, and my pronouns are she and her. Hi, Chika. Thank you. <laughs> and um, so 2015 is when you started Equatal, but we've known each other longer than that. And uh, I think I carry with me quite close when we met because we met in an organization. We were both brought into an organization to do some work with um, Indigenous women and Indigenous moms. And we were brought in separately, not knowing each other. We were both invited in to do this work without anybody telling us that the other one was going to be there. And I remember the day that I walked in, there you were, in what I thought was going to be my workshop space. <laughs> Both of us, the nature of who we are, we sort of were surprised and kind of like, oh, I'm a bit perplexed. How did this happen? What's going on here? And, and then we sort of sussed each other out, but never, like it never got even close to um, resenting the other person or targeting the other person or feeling competitive about what we've been brought in for. We just figured out very, very quickly, how do we do this together? Mm -hmm. And I think over the years we've reflected on what if it had been two different people in that space? I think it could have been really uncomfortable. Do you have the same memory of that? Yeah, I, I was there first as a, um, <laughs> a practicum student. So I think I had some idea that they were, because I was supposed to be, um, I guess, doing a bit of a research project around an arts-based community program that the organization was running. And I knew that they were looking for the 
facilitator to do the arts piece and I was just there to do sort of the interviewing piece I guess um, and so I knew that they were looking for somebody but the communication was not very great in terms of introducing us to yeah. each other before just yeah. throwing us in there yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then I think we just immediately became family that's yeah. that's how my memory holds it it was just like oh now we know each other now we're in each other's lives forever yeah totally. yeah and you didn't have you hadn't been pregnant yet you didn't have Keystone no but that was around that same time so that was the last semester of my undergrad at UBC in First Nations and Indigenous Studies that was our final practicum project. And I think I found out I was pregnant in maybe March of that year. And um, classes finished in April and grad was in May. So, so yeah, we would have been working on that together when I was pregnant. So I've almost, the entire time I've known you, had Keystone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know this, so I wonder, what when you moved from being Danette to being Keystone's mom, did any did that change your course of studies? I guess so because I don't think I was so set on doing grad school when I finished my undergrad. I was mostly just set on being done school for a while. And then I was working in Indigenous program evaluation with reciprocal consulting and I was I guess uncertain about what to do next, but when I was pregnant and thinking about what my next move would be when I would go back to work, I just thought, oh, if I can, if I go back to school, I'll be able to sort out some funding and I'll still have lots of at-home time because I knew that already from being a university student that it's quite flexible. Mm -hmm. So that was just the route I decided to go and I applied to grad school well. I think I was interviewing masters, potential master supervisors when she was like three months old in the carrier up at campus. <laughs> and I started um, in September when she was nine months old, yeah. My masters in health sciences. And then, will you, um, I wanna ask you about when Keystone was born. And I know that I know that for our people, the stories of birth and of birthing and of becoming mums isn't, uh, I don't think it's the same narrative as in dominant culture. Like I think we have the sacred nature of, of birthing and um, of transitioning from one person to two. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know that it's like, it's not always a simple story. Like I know for me, Birthing Nora was really simple and easy, and it was also incredibly complicated and layered and nuanced with, uh, it was really fraught with a lot of systemic racism. And um, so it came with like big transformation and awareness. And so, yeah, I wonder if there's any part of your, that journey for you that you can share. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Keystone's birth story is a story that I'll always come back to throughout my life and harvest new teachings from it. Um, but I would say that what you're speaking to, I would say, honestly, it, it almost started from the moment of conception. I knew when she was conceived and I had a doctor's appointment a couple weeks later and I asked them, I told them that I thought I was pregnant and they I told them when I thought I conceived and they said, no, there's no way you would know that it's too soon. So we did a test. The test was negative. But then sure enough, I missed my cycle and I was pregnant. So I was right. Um, and I think it was just that sort of just began that experience of prenatal health care and um, perinatal health care, where the health care system is really comfortable telling you no, you don't know your own body. Um, we know what's best for you. Mm -hmm. And when I knew that I was pregnant for sure, it was confusing because I knew already that it was a very sacred time in my life and that I wanted to call in lots of um, support for that 
in a spiritual and cultural way. And also I had lots of questions around different parts of my cultural lifestyle, like can I still use these plant medicines? Can I still do these ceremonies? But then there was also this dominant culture narrative around don't tell anybody you're pregnant until 12 weeks. So I just felt really isolated and alone with what to do about all of that in the first trimester. I was also really nauseous and sick, which didn't help. The feeling isolated and also just feeling like, yeah, the only people I could really talk to about it were my mom and sister and my midwives and her dad. Um, I did seek out midwifery care because I knew that one of our professors in First Nations and Indigenous Studies, that his partner was a midwife um, at a practice nearby where I lived at Pomegranate Midwives. So uh, she's not Indigenous herself, but I knew that I would um, receive good care from her that was culturally safe. So I was able to get in um, to their practice as a patient. And midwifery care was amazing, actually. Um, that totally blew my mind. I never had an experience before of having a healthcare provider that I could call and just ha like call in a prescription for me from home without even leaving my couch. And it was really nice, but it was still missing just that cultural, spiritual aspect. And so I was very lucky at the time because I had friends from UBC, other indigenous women, who were getting into doula care, one who I knew was a doula, one who I knew um, was wanting to be a doula. And I was friends with them, and also I myself was really interested in that work. I think, like you said, at the end of my degree, I was really interested in working with women and moms and interested in Indigenous feminist studies. And I was also volunteering a lot at the UBC farm at the Indigenous garden there and um, helping out the elders and plant medicines also sort of just feels like it's a part of nat a natural fit with that, those interests. So um, I reached out to my friends who were doulas uh, when I was ready and asked them to support me as well. I passed them tobacco. One actually was in Anishinaabe as well. And so I asked her first, um, just wanting to have that like, support from someone from my own background. And then my other friend who is a more experienced doula, she was also friends with my daughter's dad and I ended up asking her at a different point to also be at my birth, mostly to support her dad. <laughs> it's kind of his doula. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely felt like that doula care, that indigenous doula care for me was filling a gap in my care um, around, you know, cultural and spiritual support that obviously was missing from the mainstream healthcare system and that felt just as important or if not more important than anything else. Yeah, I think in the old days before colonialism, we didn't have we didn't have some a person who would be called a doula. We had aunties and we had family members and community mm -hmm. around us and so having a designated title and training to be that support, but we're also still aunties. And so we do that. It's an integrated mm -hmm. birth support. And I think having, having support for both parents and for emerging grandparents and siblings of the newborn and like the whole family, just mm -hmm. like normalizing, it's just, it's just the shape of the family's changing. Mm -hmm. And and I think having it just be very, very uh, commonplace is what, like birth didn't used to be this whole separate silo of, of our lives. And I think that's, that's what you're talking about is the reintegration into just, it's just part of our lives. It's part of the natural cycle. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. What was Keiston's birth like? The actual birth? It was intense. It was, it started at, I guess, six in the morning. I woke up. She was due December 7th. So the day before, December 6th, I woke up with cramps and they did subside after a couple hours. So 
I, I had no idea what to expect, so I just thought, okay, this is probably a sign that things are going to happen this week. <laughs> and it was Christmas time, so um, I, I was also on my own at the time, so I wasn't with her dad. So I was staying with my mom, and uh, her and I went Christmas shopping that day. I was kind of walking around chapters, looking up books, kind of stopping, breathe through a bit of a cramp, and then on my way. Um, but by evening time after dinner, it really started to ramp up again. And I had decided with her dad that he would be there. Um, and so I called him and I said, I think things are happening. So I think you should come over. So he came over. I was staying up, I, I was living up at SFU at the time, up on Burnaby Mountain. And he came over and we were watching a movie just past the time and all of a sudden the power cut out and I, it was just one of those things where I thought it would flicker and come back on but it didn't and there was a really big windstorm outside. And so the power didn't come back on and my cramps really started to pick up. So I was sort of, I guess, laboring there in the dark for a couple hours. And then I realized, okay, things are really happening. I, I had the contraction timer app. I was timing them. I think her dad was just snoozing on the couch. Um, and I started to get worried because I planned a home birth and I started to wonder if I could have a home birth with no power. So I paged the midwives to ask them. They said they hadn't done that before, but they would get back to me. They called back and said that it would be okay. Um, they had what they needed. Uh, they didn't need power. But so at that point, I things had really picked up. So I called my doulas and my mom. Uh, they made their way over. And by the time they got there around 10, I think like things were quite, um, were really happening. And by, I think midnight, the midwives got there and checked me and I was, um, like things were definitely gonna happen that night. So um, I think the power came on around 2 a.m. I don't remember at that point. My doulas had set it up really nice with candles and um, it was really beautiful. Like, you know, there were lots of parts where I was just, I, I remember wanting my mom's support a lot actually, but it was overnight and obviously people were tired and needed to take breaks and rest. And I remember my doulas and Keiston's dad in the background at different times, like burning medicine, singing songs. So that's really a beautiful part of that memory. Mm -hmm. um, I pushed for a couple hours at home and she just wasn't coming and I was so exhausted at that point. I think it was close to seven in the morning. So I hadn't slept all night and um, we made the decision to go to Burnaby Hospital and see, get the OB just to check me and see what was going on. So we drove through Monday morning rush hour while I was like fully dilated. I, I thought, <laughs> I felt like at one point Keystone was gonna be born in the back of my car. My mom was driving. Um, and by the time we got to the hospital, it was just so intense and she ended up being born 40 minutes after we got to the hospital. So basically, I got there, I just stormed upstairs to the maternity unit <laughs> because I was so not able to have a conversation at the triage desk. And um, the doctor had to turn her manually. She was turned the wrong way, she was just backwards facing. So. Um, after he turned her, she was born really quickly. It's so funny that your description from beginning to end is really like understanding your body and checking in with your body. And I had a similar, I'd actually, you know, for a long, long time, I really thought about my pregnancy with Nora and my birth with Nora. And then now she's 17 and it's not that I don't think about it, but it's not quite as fresh. But with each piece that you lay out, I have these really visceral memories and um, Nora was she was due on September 11th and when I when the midwives I also had midwives and planned for a home birth and the the midwives when they when I first met them they looked at you know the last cycle and you know establishing when is the when is the due date and they said, oh, it's September 11th. Well, we can give you a different one. We won't, we, you don't have to take September 11th. <laughs> it's like, no, I totally want to take September 11th. That's the due date. They ended up 
choosing for me that it would be September 8th. So there was like sort of the, the beginning of, like it was very symbolic of how, how care looks, right? Like just these tiny moves and challenges. But I loved both of my midwives and um, she, Nora was born on August 28th and she was born at a, around 11 at night. And that morning I was walking from my house down to the yoga studio to have a yoga practice. And I remember getting about, like, so it's two blocks from my house to the yoga studio and I got about a block and then I had this like really weird feeling behind my pubic bone and, and but I just kind of ignored it and kept going. And then I started my yoga class and I could do all the like bendy, stretchy things, but I guess she dropped and in the middle of yoga. <laughs> and so by the end of class, I could no longer bend over because she was just right down there. And, and she was born that, that evening and here in my house with my mom and my dad and my brother and his best friend and Nora's dad was still around and uh, I had a friend and then my two midwives and my niece and nephew were also here and um, but uh, such such strange memories that I so my dad was alive and he isn't now but he he at one point decided he needed to host everybody and feed everybody so he jumped in the car and drove all the way. Maybe he just actually wanted to get out of the house because <laughs> maybe he was freaking him out. But he drove all the way across town to his favorite Mexican restaurant and brought back burritos and tacos and chocolate cake for everybody from Topanga Cafe. And, and I remember really distinctly sitting in the little pool in my bedroom, the little birthing pool, and somebody came in. I don't know if it was my midwife or, and I was sort of, the water was a bit too warm and so I kept falling asleep and then waking up from the con contractions. And somebody came in and all of a sudden it just smelled like feces in the room. And that's when I learned that garlic translates to the smell of feces for a lot of birthing women. <laughs> I was like, it was just disgusting. And so the midwife was like, there's garlic in the food. Everybody brush your teeth and starts handing out gum to everyone. And my dad was like, oh, I haven't been hosting very well. So he offered to help in a different way. And so one of the, one of the practices, one of the cultural practices that we have where I come from is you don't, prepare for the baby until the baby's here. The baby has to arrive. And if you prepare too soon, it's saying you have something that you don't and it's laughing at the ancestors and it's arrogant. And so I didn't have anything, which made my midwives terribly uncomfortable. I didn't have baby blankets. I didn't have diapers. I didn't have clothes. I didn't have anything, which was fine with me because I didn't have a baby yet. But so at a certain point, my dad said, the baby's really coming. Now can I go get baby clothes? And I had a rule. I was really, I was really rigid about my values and everyone had to adhere to my values and my parenting. And so I had a rule that nobody was allowed to go consume and buy things for my baby. They could give me hand-me-downs or they could get used things. So my dad, I said, yeah, you can go. Like I, by that time, I was, it was very active labor. And so I said, fine. Uh, so my dad decided uh, he would go. He left the house with my brother to go to Value Village, which is a couple blocks away to, pie, to go find baby clothes. And, and then he told the story later that they got halfway between our house and Value Village, which is five blocks or something. And he got about three blocks away and they were in the car. And then he stopped at a light and he realized, wait a second, Jada's not in the car. We don't have to go to Value Village. And they drove to the gap. <laughs> <laughs> so Nora's first clothes were these really adorable little baby gap clothes. And I think it was the most rebellious thing my dad ever did to me. <laughs> Yeah, so that I, I also go back 
into those stories, into those memories. And I, I feel like I visit those stories. I don't just re, retell them. Like I sit with them and I, I feel like I sit with them and they're like a visitor. They're like a, they're like a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I see what's, what's here according to what I know now. And I think at the time I didn't know I was really missing culture in my birth. I knew something wasn't fulfilled in the story and that drove me to go and get my doula training so that I could support other women. But I wonder what drove you to do your work as a doula? Yeah, so I would say a really similar thing. I feel like my pregnancy was this catalyst for just really starting to feel very strongly about the importance of culture in that journey and cultural support. And so um, as I was working with my doulas during my pregnancy, just learning about their work from the perspective of being their client, um, they were really, you know, trying to start a bit of a community around what they were doing. And I was really interested in joining their work. Um, obviously at that time I was focused on my own pregnancy and birth, but I knew that eventually I would wanna be doing doula work too. And so we ended up having this dinner with at Salmon and Bannock with um, Jessica Danforth from the Native Youth Sexual Health ne Network was out from Ontario. And she met with us and just um, gave us some like mentorship and tips around starting a doula collective, what that could look like, what other things were happening around the country. There wasn't really much at that time. And so kind of from that dinner, the Equato Collective was born. Um, and it was myself and Keisha Charnley and Jessica St. Jean and Sophie Bender Johnson, the three of whom are all now midwives. Um, and we just sort of started meeting monthly maybe at each of our houses and just kind of birthing this beautiful vision together around a community of practice and care um, that Indigenous families could go to to find Indigenous doulas and helpers for pregnancy, birth, and, and also other pregnancy journeys like um, abortion, loss, miscarriage, um, moon time even, and also a community of practice where other Indigenous birth workers could find each other and just be in each other's company. And because the context of our work is different, like you said, and the challenges that we face are really different. And also we're a part of the communities that we serve. So we're not just theorizing like racism in the healthcare system, we're also experiencing it. And so, um, yeah, it just felt really important and necessary. And so that's what we did. So I have twice referred people to your collective for their pregnancies and both times have heard the stories back about the transformational experience of having you involved in the birth and your team involved in the birth and in the pre-birth and in the follow-up and um, and it feels like what was birthed out of a missingness has done more than actually the goal because the goal was to fill something but actually you've grown something so like it the stories that i hear are not yeah they help me work through some of the racism in the system it's actually there was so much love there was so much care and so much abundance mm -hmm. and that people the birthing families that i've heard reflections back from describe um, that they didn't even know what they were missing until it was f full and then overflowing. And I feel like that's actually the opportunity that we get when our people come in to fill those spaces is we remember abundance mm. and, and we actualize that because we have so much as a people. Yeah. I think a lot of the work that we do is you know, because Indigenous people, as Indigenous people, we're very diverse and so often I'm working with people who are not of the same cultural background with me. And my job is not to, like, push my own cultural teachings or practices onto those families, but just 
as an indigenous person with my own teachings, I can ask them like, oh, this is what we do where I come from. What do you do? Or what do you want to bring into your birth? And sometimes it's nothing like that. So not everybody wants to have, you know, this like culturally connected home birth experience like some of us maybe do. Um, for other people, safety and comfort looks different. Also, there's lots of challenges that people face too with the evacuation policy, people having to leave their homes and communities to go birth in different ones. Um, some people don't have like adequate housing for a home birth. So there's lots of different scenarios. Um, but just to be able to, I think, um, provide that kind of um, care where you can just like ask people to draw and help them to draw on the, the own, their own strengths that already exist in their family, in their community, in their own um, ways of knowing, I think is really powerful. So in that way, I just feel like sometimes I'm just, I'm just a facilitator in a way. Like I'm not providing anything. I'm just helping them see what's already there. Yeah, it's a real difference between a doctor who carries the expertise and you recognize that the family or the birthing person carries the expertise. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just a different, like I don't think in dominant culture that the questions aren't even asked, like the options aren't even laid out. So how do you know that there's even options? Mm -hmm. You're just told a few pieces and then where do you, in, where do you even fit? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but it's, it's hugely important work. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it sets the stage for people's stories and how they can visit those stories as they reflect back. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can just tell about your collective, the name and what the name means, and, um, and then we can put that information on our Drawing Wisdom website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Equatal means family in the Squamish language, and that name was gifted to us by an elder from the Squamish nation through um, Jessica St. Jean, who's a member of our collective, who's also from the Squamish Nation. And um, I think when we received that name, it was like, yeah, it was just sort of serendipitous. Like it, it just felt like the perfect fit for our work because I think within mainstream healthcare, there is such an emphasis on the dyad and just moms or just babies. Um, but in our way, of looking at it as Indigenous birth workers, our work is um, actually about families and about communities and and it's also about our relationships with the land and all of our non-human kin. So, um, so for us that name just speaks to a model of care that's more holistic mm -hmm. and kinship based than, um, than what we're used to seeing I guess in the, in the wider world. And uh, so, like I said, um, we provide, we're all birth workers who work autonomously, um, who are part of that collective. And so um, we provide prenatal birth, postpartum care, but also a lot of what we do is community-based education. So we've created an indigenous doula training program. We've created a, an indigenous prenatal class that we've uh, taught twice now, and we'll be continuing to teach through Vancouver Coastal Health, um, and um, and we do mentorship as well. So some of the more experienced doulas in our collective um, are mentoring uh, newer up, up and coming doulas as well. And then some of the doulas in our collective have transitioned to now being midwives. So um, so they're offering midwifery care in the communities that we're working in. So. Um, so not everyone is working as a doula at all times, but we all just sort of have this community that we can all come back to and, um, and learn and grow together. This is funny, but I just have the worst pictures from <laughs> the beginning of her life. Like I didn't take any pictures and the ones that I have, I mean, oh, these maternity shots are nice because a photographer did them and these when she was 10 weeks old are nice too, but these are all just, they're great. iPhone photos, and that's all I have. They're great. I was just so in it, and so, 
you know, rocked that um, yeah. the photos was like the last thing on my mind. I'm just not that kind of a person. Oh, she's so cute. She That's is. my favorite. That's the first day. Was it? She's super cute. Her little chubby cook'em face. She just came out all squished up. Thanks everyone for joining in with the Drawing Wisdom video podcast. I feel so lucky I get to be in these conversations with amazing people. And I also feel really lucky I get to share them with a larger audience so that we can all benefit from the good teachings. Please come back again. Next episode, we'll be visiting with Auntie Allen, Allen Lindley. And um, that conversation promises to be dynamic and rich and wonderful and full of stories and beads. Hi, Chika. Hi, Equa, and take good, gentle care of each other. Mm -hmm.